I'm Hugh Hewitt. Markets are not acting the way we expect. John Campbell and I just discussed that. And I have David Bonson now from the Bonson Group out on the West Coast. Good morning, David. How are you? Well, good morning, Hugh. Doing well. Well, I just said oil is down, gold is down, futures are up. This is not what I expected after Israel took 350 missiles, even though none of them killed anybody yet. One, one Bedouin girl is deeply injured. What is going on here, David? Yeah, I can see why it is a surprise, but I want to explain why it's actually what you would expect. It's unwinding everything that was done on Friday. Going into Friday, the market action was preparing for something to happen over the weekend. So you had bond yields drop because people were flying to safety. Stocks got crushed. Oil was up. Gold was up. Then over the weekend, you had this event that obviously was a horrific attack from a bad actor against a good actor, and the good guys won so far. So the markets are now unwinding what they did on Friday. As you said, there wasn't a large death count, and there is anticipation that this may start to de-escalate, that Iran is saying, okay, we did our piece, and so forth. So markets could be wrong. It may re-escalate. But right now, it's just financial markets unwinding the fears from Friday. Now, David, uh, assume for a moment that Dr. Oren, who was on earlier, is right, and that Israel must respond and do so in a visible way. What happens after they do that? It, it's very difficult to answer how markets respond to geopolitical events because I've studied 100 years of market responses, and it never, and I mean never, goes the way you expect. Sometimes there's high volatility, Hugh, for 10 days, and then things are completely back to normal. When Hamas launched that absolutely unspeakable attack on October 7th, the stock market was up the next day. The bond market was closed because it was Columbus Day in America, so you kind of got a distorted response. But it's short term and a few months out, it's sometimes a big surprise. I think Israel will respond, but the way markets respond is going to depend on what the response is and where the U.S. is in, in it. I mean, what type of response they do coordinated between Israel and the U.S. against Iran will totally drive market response. David Bonson, CEO of the Bonson Group, I also have to ask you, the Iranians grabbed their fourth big ship and seized it and took it. It's docked. I just saw a picture of it. I posted it on my ex account. It's docked with the other three tankers they've taken, the Houthis are continuing to shoot at the Red Sea traffic. What is this doing to the international economy? Well, so far there hasn't been a huge impact, and there's been a few different things that have been shaking out over the last uh, couple of weeks. It has, it has moved the markets marginally. Um, on, on a supply chain level, I don't want to say there's been no change, but it's been marginal. But again, marginal supply chain issues have a way of turning into larger ones, and it's very difficult to overreact because there's so many moving parts. But again, oil prices had been steadily in the 75 range for much of last year. And they've really been kind of baked into 85 now, not just for a few days, but for a few weeks. But 85 is a lot different than 100. And if it holds here in the high 80s, that may just be markets saying they're content that production levels are sufficient, even with any supply disruptions that could come about. Last question, David. The inflation numbers on Friday also spooked a lot of people. I, I, can't, I think they're kind of inevitable, given the amount of money in the system. But what do you think about that sticky inflation fear? Well, this is an area, Hugh, where you have to forgive me because I don't have the party line on what's going on here. Um, I don't think this is a political story in, in terms of the way I'm economically analyzing it. It's purely political in the fact that no matter what, higher prices hurt the incumbent. But you more or less have major categories in deflation right now. Travel costs went way down, used car prices, apparel, clothing. But a 22% spike year over year in auto insurance really skewed the data. Um, and there has been stickiness in a lot of services where core goods have been at about flat level for quite some time. The whole problem with this, Hugh, is that it was never primarily about uh, the politics of it. It was about the supply chain being shut down after COVID. And so I think people draw a meta narrative out of what their desired political view is, where to me, I think all the excess money that's out there 
um, ultimately puts downward pressure on growth because the debt has to be paid in the future and that takes away from growth. So it, when people on the right talk about a too hot economy, an economy running too hot, it drives me crazy. People have uh, a job does not create inflation. It, was it correct that the 330,000 jobs were part-time jobs by and large? Um, there were a significant amount of part-time, but that, no, not all 330,000 were. 39,000 construction jobs were full-time. 70,000 food, beverage, hospitality were full-time. Um, but there is a 0.1% move higher in part-time relative to the, the norm. Um, but the weekly unemployment claims tell you all you need to know. We can look at the household survey, the ADP. There's all this skewed and, and conflicting data. People take unemployment when they don't have jobs, so they're not taking unemployment. And what's that tell us, David, quickly? I, I don't know. We, our major job problem is not that people who want a job can't find one. Our major job problem is ah. we don't have enough workers looking for a job. Labor participation, that's our problem. David Bonson, follow him on Twitter, on X at David Bonson, B-A-H-N-S-E-N. 